Welcome to Spoilers. Hey there. It's just me and Stevie. Good old skeleton crew. Talking about a movie that made us both cry, Coco. Did you see me crying? I didn't see you crying. Did you see me crying? No, because I just, I think, I think I was like, I saw a nurse crying profusely. And I was like, oh, my mom lost it. My mom is the school nurse, by the way. And this is spoilers. We should, uh, I guess, introduce ourselves before we get too much into it. I'm Pappy from Denver. I'm Stevie from Northern Indiana. And Stevie, it's the easiest you are way to describe. of Latino descent. I right? am of Hispanic descent. You are correct. So this is your jam, Day of the Dead. Yeah, I was so pumped. I thought Disney was really going to do like a one foot in, one foot out and like not go full, I guess you could say like Latino or like Mexican heritage. And they dove all in because I did not see one white person in this entire movie, which was really refreshing. Well, give us the main spoiler. Probably that Ernesto de la Cruz isn't Miguel's father. Grandpapa? See. Si. Well, he's his great grandpa, right? He he was gonna be, but then he didn't end up being. Yeah, like I could. Did you kind of get the vibe halfway through? Like especially when he. F- I I got it. I got it before you did. So you turned to me at one point in the movie and said, "I don't think that's his grandpa." And it's who's the other character? It's Hector. Uh, Hector. 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 Yeah. They uh, there's no other reason for Hector to be in this movie uh, if he's not Miguel's real dad. Especially like when he catches him and like cradles him in his arms. But... Right, and the introduction of Hector is really strange. Because like he's trying to get past, I guess you could call it heaven customs. And get into mm-hmm. like, get back to like the living world to see like his family. And he's kind of pushed aside, kind of like Aladdin is a street urchin. And then all of a sudden him and, him and uh, was it Miguel? Yeah. And then Miguel Not team Coco. up for the rest of the movie. <laughs> Yeah, the main character's name isn't Coco. It's actually the Abu Ab- Abuela, uh, right? It's the uh, well, it's um, it's the grandma, his great grandma, great grandma Abuelita. Yeah, it's Abuelita. Uh, yeah, and her name's Coco, and that's sort of the bridge. The whole mystery of the movie is who is her father, aka Miguel's great grandfather, great great, um, great great grandfather, uh. I guess, what did you think about the way this movie looked overall? I thought it's one of the best animated movies I've ever seen. I thought it ever. was beautiful. Yeah. Like, so much detail in every shot. You could just, um, it really shined, like, on the nighttime shots, when they got to use really bright colors in the night. Like you said, it's a very purple movie. And um, I thought, like, one of the, outside of, like, when he looks out, like at the city when he goes to like the land of the dead. Um, I thought one of the most beautiful things is when he's like walking across the bridge, and those orange leaves are kind of shuffling under his feet. Like there's so much detail in this movie. It looked incredible. And, and you looked at me during one of the last scenes of the movie where uh, Miguel and who's actually, excuse me, actually his great grandpa Hector Hector. are in a pit with water and the water is, some of the most unreal water, it or, or real. most most realistic animation. Yeah, you, like you don't even think it's for a second that it's fake. It's incredible. Like, like there are th- every drop. There are better like, than Moana. Uh, three shots in this movie where you're like, if you just put that in a standard movie, people are like, yeah, that's a real shot. Um, when he's running towards like the plaza at night, and it kind of pulls back to where you can only see figures walking through like a uh, kind of a crowded street. That looks real. Uh, the water is, like you said, the most realistic water you've ever seen. Is there any more other shots you can think of? Uh, there, there's one, and it's been in all of the trailers, and it's on the poster. I think we've even tweeted it. But like, yeah, when uh Miguel is first entering the city of the dead or something, uh-huh. it looks it looks like a like a a hive, like a a big giant Tokyo, but it's all like purple mm-hmm. and dark. And that like, they, I think they even say something like in the uh previews at the beginning like it took like how many millions of frames like it's insane like and just for that one shot if i correct me if i'm wrong i think this is the longest in production pixar movie ever i think that might be correct they i mean this wasn't even pre-production they started production in 2011 which is weird to me i do i don't think this movie got a great marketing campaign from pixar and and let's go ahead and and bring it up uh you texted me back in July, and you said, uh-oh. I said, what? I was so nervous. You said, 
You said Pixar or Disney has no confidence in Coco. I said, why? And you said they're putting Olaf's Frozen Adventure in front of it. I mean, this has already gotten a lot of hate. I don't know how much more we can add to that conversation. It was a half hour had... musical about nothing. It had funny moments, though. You it had I mean? really like... good music. I'll admit that. The music was really good. There were funny moments. Uh, Josh Gad is a, a tremendous voice actor. But uh, I don't think it added a whole lot to the Frozen lore, if you want to call it that. Well, we had like a relatively early screening and i had no idea this 20 minute epic frozen prequel was coming and apparently this was supposed to be a abc tv special and then they like pivoted it and put it in front of coco like we tweeted literally just to get white people to see coco which is really sad is it me i mean i i cut the cord with cable like two years ago but i honestly feel like for a pixar movie like you said earlier they did zero marketing with this movie I, I didn't see much. I saw like there's like some like kids meals at Subway, but I feel like I saw more for Cars 3 than I did for Coco, which is a damn shame. Like if you ever go to like a metropolis, say like New York, Chicago, like when it, like a Pixar movie is coming, you'll see billboards everywhere. Yeah. I mean, you'll see Disney stuff everywhere. And I was in Chicago was it two, three weeks ago and I saw nothing for Coco. Before this even came out. Which yeah, which is strange to me too because I feel like Disney is learning that it's profitable to embrace uh, stories from other cultures. Like, like you know, sh- social justice warrior aside, it's just like smart business because there's like great stories from all around the world. Like, and you've seen it like in the past with like Mulan and some other, other projects. But Pocahontas. Like, with Moa- yeah, with Moana recently and now with this, like... It's making a lot of money for them. Or even Big Hero 6. It, exactly, yeah. So, I mean, they are embracing other cultures, which is nice. Um, I guess I'll move it this way. Uh, we both love the hell out of Coco. Do you, did you have any gripes with it throughout the movie? It's not... It's not a perfect narrative in the sense that uh, the Miguel's family, which is very, like, matriarchal centered his grandma runs the family now and they've all been doing uh creating shoes they're cobblers uh yeah all the way up to the great great grandma who learned how to make his shoes uh it gives you that exposition dump at the beginning similar to up but it doesn't have the same emotional resonance i didn't love that uh what do you think about the opening sort of uh prologue scene how he kind of described like what happened through like those paper machés like hanging through the buildings. They they exit out of it in a very clever way. Like they make a joke. He, he's shouting a guy. She's like, "Dude, I don't care about your life story," <laughs> which was funny. Yeah. But at the same time, you have to sit through ten minutes of exposition after you had to watch. Um, it a 20 wasn't a great movie. intro by any stretch. Um, but it instantly forgives itself with just. I think the character of Miguel has a great energy to him, and. Mm-hmm. Like, the way it goes, like, n- there's no music allowed in the family. And you just get behind Miguel immediately, who wants to be a guitarist in the worst way. And from then on, you, I mean, it just, it kicks off into, uh, you know, he's thinking that Ernesto de la Cruz is his great, great grandpappy. And, mm-hmm. uh, it just, uh, I mean, what really lost me was I actually really enjoyed the intro. What lost me was when he got to the land of the dead and they threw in like eight family characters. That's when the movie kind of started to lose me of, okay, where is this going? Cause it really lost its energy. Um, a lot of what I thought were supposed to be comedic moments didn't land. Uh, well, yeah, like w- once he gets into the day of the dead, he has like all of his mini quests. It's like, Oh, you got to find a guitar guitar achieved <laughs> you know what i mean like it mo- oh you got to play this thing like he plays at the thing but it doesn't work out now you gotta sneak into the thing and i also you know I mean? did it's love like the inclusion little... of his grandma's um alabrie uh that you know neon leopard with wings uh it, i didn't i liked it you liked it i liked it per- yeah i thought it was cool i thought it was beautiful i thought it was cool too it was just kind of a weird inclusion at the start when those like it's like you said like there's a million side quests this thing is trying to track hector and coco oh not coco uh, miguel well no the whole point of the thing is to like bring the grandma and the other like 
uh, tios and right aunts and whatever. Like you need like a tracking device, and that's what the purpose of that serves. It's a plot device, but it looks really cool. So whatever. Uh, the thing I want to hit on was how awesome was the music in this? It was great, and, and of course, like the "Remember Me." That's the moment. If you, if you haven't seen this this movie. He sings Remember Me to his great grandma. And it's such an earned moment too, because like in that opening exposition scene, like they show like this like montage of them like playing together and the great grandma's just like a piece of furniture, like a vegetable. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like playing with her, like telling her all his secrets, like putting a wrestling mask on her. It's freaking hilarious. But then it's it's very earned because like her dad is the character who Miguel has this adventure with in the Day of the Dead, and he sings a song to her. And it's woof that moment because she starts to sing. God damn, man. Super sad. Instant tears for me. I was that's why I was looking around the theater. I was like, really hoping I'm not the only one crying. So I looked to my you know, my right, saw a nurse, saw your sister, and I saw my wife, and I was like, okay, it's acceptable to cry. But um But yeah. Yeah, to your question, I guess Remember Me is the song I remember most. Is there other songs? That you, I, honestly, kind of like a lot of the music's kind of forgettable. Like, I know they did like a musical number on the stage at one point, but I can't. That was really my favorite song. Uh, song by far. What was it? Uh, yeah, what was the song? La Llorona. Okay. And that's when, I mean, it's all in Spanish, and the guitar behind it sounds amazing. Uh, the, the woman who sings it sounds incredible. I can't think of the name of my on top of my head. And it, if you can compare it to anything, it kind of reminds you of... You, do you remember Shrek 2? I guess, unfortunately. <laughs> well, I know, but there's a... There's a it kind of reminded me of that I Need a Hero scene in Shrek 2. And, uh, yeah, except this is like original music, though. Like, Well, yeah, I mean, it's uh, kind of, yeah. I mean, it's just a different composition of a very old song. But, um... The music's really good, especially with the guitars they get behind it. Uh, remember me, um, what was the other song? Uh, Un Poco Loco? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Un Poco Loco. Un Poco Loco. Uh, What's that? Uh, he does like this, like, ay 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 thing at one point in the song. Oh, the Stevie, scre- can you? The scream of the mariachi? Can you, can you do that? When I'm drunk. <laughs> <laughs> I won't do it now. <laughs> All right, well, it, we got a lot left for the listener at home. Is there anything else you want to say about Coco? Are you ready for yes or no's? The thing that's cool about Coco is it's not just a great animated movie. It's great Disney. It's just a great movie. Um, Fantastic. It's just, yeah. I mean, you know, I could say, like, oh, it's the best animated movie of the year, but it's actually one of the best movies of the year. It's a lot of fun. It's very heartfelt. Um, like Pap said, a lot of things, is, a lot of things are earned. And, I mean, they spent close to six seven years on this movie and it looks beautiful so i would say definitely go see it in theaters uh so is that a yes or no from you <laughs> uh i would say a hard yes and i'm still trying to rank it in my pixar lore what about you yeah i was gonna say what, what do you think like where is that in the pixar you think it's top three top four i top would two? say top three um my number one Pixar movie of all time is Ratatouille. I think that movie is just a gem. I know it's not loved by everybody, but I absolutely adore that movie. And then I think Patton. The Incredibles and Coco would uh, be a tie with each other for two and three. That's pretty good, yeah. I I love this movie. Um, I have never cried in a movie theater before until this movie. And for that reason, it's my number one Pixar movie of all time. I think it's, I've got it right now, like top five of the year, top six of the year. It's a stone cold lead pipe lock for best animated feature, of course. But when you look at like the animation in this, it's literally some of the best animation I've ever seen. And the story is very earned. It's a very patient story. Uh, like we mentioned, like if there is a problem with the narrative, it's the fact that in the second act they go on a bunch of side quests. But like at the same time, this movie wants to explore the land of the dead. Like if we don't have those side quests, you don't meet Frida Carlo, which that whole storyline is hilarious. Uh, it's extremely hilarious, and what's also makes this really cool for a Pixar movie is Pixar is re- 
done something recently that I can't stand, and they've been adding sequels on sequels to their movies. It's like pick, well, that's dude, to Pixar I, stories. We talked about this, like. When Bob Iger first took over Walt Disney Studios, it's like on the heels of like Bolt and all those terrible Home on like the Range movies they had. Home on the Range, Brother Bear, uh, and then like he's like, no more sequels. We're gonna focus on individual stories, and, that, and like that's what Pixar got into. And like this is an original story. It's a hard yes for me. Um, and like I said, it's a stone cold lead pipe lock for best animated feature. It's definitely going to be in my top 10 might sneak in the top five of the year. But what uh, makes this interesting too, is like there's, this is a heavy kids movie. It's, it's dealing with some super adult themes. Like, like you're dealing with like a like father death. that supposedly left. Yeah. But he actually got murdered by his best friend. That could be a movie in its own. You know what I mean? It's just, it's a very, uh, like I said, it deals with extremely adult themes. If you have a chance, definitely see this in theaters. So what we're going to do now is we're going to toss it to Carter, and he better not shit out on us. He's going to leave us a voicemail review. We toss it to Mikey after that. If you want to leave us a voicemail review, the number is 903-776-4507. Uh, but after we come back from that short break, Stevie and I got to talk about every villain's death oh in the history of God everything disney that's probably what you tuned in for it's gonna be great but take it away carter take it away money and we'll toss it to spoiler man after that and be back right after this hey guys sorry i couldn't make the coco podcast uh i'm recording this separately and uh hopefully it gets edited in to uh the main podcast uh i think we should start off with just the music uh, the music in Coco was incredible. There's Spanish guitar all over the place. Really great soundtrack. I think everybody that was singing, all of the voice actors, did an incredible job. And um, I thought they all just killed it. Uh, as far as animation goes, I think this is one of the best animated movies that I've seen from Disney Pixar. And probably by far and away the best animated movie of the year so far there's a lot of garbage coming out i know we all love boss baby it might be the greatest movie of all time but i think coco was right up there with boss baby uh in terms of animation um the colors in in coco are just incredible uh as miguel travels over to the land of the dead it's just really bright vibrant colors the animals are crazy colors everything's kind of neon and fluorescent pinks and yellows and blues and greens it's just really crazy it looks like an acid trip um as far as being true to mexican culture i think this movie does a great job uh, i don't think disney pixar does a really good job of of uh showcasing other cultures very well i think it's a lot of just talking animals and whitewashing but uh i think they did a really good job and i think being part Mexican and I think other Mexicans will agree that this is a really good fun and uh, easily accessible representation in Mexican culture I think anybody could watch this and not have a real problem following any of the uh, kind of the things that Mexican people are known for I mean there's a there's a couple scenes that I wanted to talk about where the grandma kind of like uses a chancla to beat the shit out of out of a mariachi guy that I found hilarious. Um, and also uh, a scene where she's like force feeding Miguel more and more tamales that are just very true to Mexican culture. And I think uh, it doesn't go over over anybody's head if you're not Hispanic. I think that kind of humor can just like resonates with everybody um i think this movie has one of the darker uh endings to any disney pixar movie that i've ever seen there's like a a a legitimate murder uh that happens um the twist ending is ernesto de la cruz uh is not miguel's real grandfather and he poisons miguel's real grandfather um so I don't think I've ever seen that in a Disney Pixar movie, and I, I was honestly kind of shocked. 
but uh, I, overall I thought the uh, the story was great. I didn't have a problem with the murder. I just thought it was kind of off base for Disney Pixar. I, I'm not upset that it happened, but it just was uh, a little shocking to me. Um, there are some very heartfelt moments in this movie. Um, I know you guys probably talked about if you cried or not, and uh, I know you're interested in knowing if I did, and the answer is no, because I'm dead inside. Uh, but the biggest gripe I have with this movie is uh, Olaf's Christmas. I think uh, they really... I don't know why this was tacked on in the beginning of the movie. It just really upset me the whole time I was watching it. It's way too long. It's got to be like 20, 25 minutes long. My movie lasted forever. I didn't get out until way later than expected. Um, I was, I'm not a big fan of Frozen. I don't, especially don't care for Olaf. Uh, I hated that. I wish I never saw that. And I think, I, I think people are right to be upset that they had to sit through that thing because they went to go see Coco. They didn't go to see 20 minutes of a very half-assed, half-written Frozen script. It's It was pointless. Nobody cares about it. Just make Frozen 2 if you want more Frozen. And uh, that's got to be my biggest gripe with Coco. Um, other than that, I love the movie. I think it's going to win, hands down, uh best animated movie of the year boss babies might give it a run for its money we don't know yet it's, it's a uh, neck and neck there so uh who knows but uh that'll be my review of coco uh i'm interested to hear what you guys say so uh that was spoilers our email is podcastspoilers at gmail.com. Twitter is at spoilers underscore pod. Our Instagram is podcastspoilers. It's lit. Josh Hensley from the Rutabaga wrote our theme. Our number is 903-776-4507. And if you enjoyed what you heard today, subscribe on SoundCloud or iTunes. Please don't forget to leave us a review by searching for movie spoilers, clicking on the cereal bowl, select the reviews tab, and leave us some stars and some words. back uh this is spoilers and uh if you're back uh, from listening to the previous segment we are going to be talking about every villain's death in a disney Let's animated go. movie in five minutes oh my Maybe god not. pappy you start <laughs> all right snow white and the seven dwarves the evil queen does die she dies of a lightning strike which causes the boulder she's on to fall and she falls and kind of gets crushed by the boulder definite fatality okay next we got pinocchio uh, Monster of the Whale runs into a cliff. I presume broke his neck or whatever that was holding him together and drowns. Definite fatality. Pretty brutal. Fantasia. There's no definite antagonist. We do have a devil guy at the end who's defeated by Silent Knight, but I'll call that a watch. Chernobyl. No bad guy. Yep. We have 1941's Thank Dumbo. You. Clowns? Not really a villain. No fatalities. Only racism. Uh, we got <laughs> Bambi. <laughs> uh, Rono. Is the evil deer. He is thrown from the cliff by Bambi in the middle of a fire, but I don't think he died. No fatality on that you one. You can't forget Hunter, who is man. He definitely died in the fire. He definitely died and deserved it. Then we got 1943, Saludos Amigos. No villains, no fatalities. Do I have? What do I have? Uh, you have three the th Cabaneros? Yeah, you have the three yeah, Cabaneros. Yeah, no, no villains, no fatalities. Yeah. Then I have uh, 1946's uh, Make... Mine music. Uh, yes, sir. <laughs> we have uh, in the Peter and the Wolf section of that movie. 
He gets uh, hogtied, paraded around town, the most likely shot to death after he's outside of town. Definite fatality. The definite antagonist of that one is racism, though. Oh, most sure. certainly. We have fun and fancy free. Uh, we have uh, Jack and the Beanstalk. There's Willie the Giant. Uh, that Beanstalk is cut down and he dies to death by falling. Second falling death. Definite fatality. There's two falling deaths in that movie, because then we have Lumpjaw the Bear. He falls off a waterfall in that movie. He definitely does, but I feel like Will the Giant was the definitive antagonist of that movie. Gotcha, gotcha. Because it's the second one. Yeah. But what am I on? I, say, I got time. 1948's Melody Time. No villains, no fatalities. Got the adventures of Ichabod and Mr. Toad. Uh, I mean, Ichabod play, uh, in the Ichabod storyline, there's no uh, fatalities. Winky gets arrested. And the Headless Horseman potentially... Uh, Ichab- or, uh, Ichabod is dead, but there's no villain fatalities for sure. So, wash. Okay, then we have Cinderella. Uh, Cinderella 1950. Lady Tremaine, evil stepmom. No death, but her soul was crushed when Cinderella became a princess. Very well done. Alice in Wonderland up next. Queen of Hearts. No death. Alice just wakes up from the dream. See, I don't remember that. I always thought she died. See, I have 1953's no, no, Peter Pan. Yeah. Uh, Captain Hook. No death, chased away by a croc throughout the uh, ocean. Woof. What years later than Tramp? Sorry. Do you, do you know that? Okay. 1955. This is one of the worst deaths of the Tramp fighting the rat. It is very violent. Oh, uh, yeah. the, the Tramp kills the rat, presumably off screen, then licks his blood off his paws <laughs> while the baby's in the room. Uh, That's where Bruce Lee got it fa- from. Definite fatality. One of the best fatalities in Disney history. Okay, next we have 1959 Sleeping Beauty, Maleficent, one of the most iconic villains of all time. Uh, gets stabbed in the chest while in dragon form by a thrown sword by Philip. Uh, then we got 101 Dalmatians, Cruel de Vil, she car crashes into a ravine. Definite fatality, but not that brutal, I would say. Correct, Amundo. Next we have uh, 1963 Sword in the Stone. Madam Mim is the villain. No death, but she does get chicken pox, so it's pretty much the same thing. Then we go to Jungle Book, Shere Khan, who I consider the main villain. He has his tail tied up at one point. There's a jungle fire, but I would presume he lived. I would say not a definite fatality. I would definitely say he lived. Okay, I was see next. Week. Okay, this is up in the air. We have uh, 1970s The Aristocats. Uh, Edgar the Butler. So... He gets locked away in a suitcase <laughs> and sent to Timbuktu. I have to imagine I thought he, he suffocated. Died. He has to die. This he has to suffocate. Lives. Yeah. Uh, minor fatality, I would say. Okay, so I got... You got Robin Hood. Uh, Robin Hood. What year is that, Stevie? 1973. Prince John is the main bad guy. He doesn't really die, but the snake... Comes and tells him, "Oh, your mom's gonna be pissed," and then he sucks his thumb. Like, "Oh, I'm a bad boy." <laughs> and so, like, no, no fatality, but embarrassment for sure. Okay, next we have uh, 1977's Long Gap, 73 to 77, The Many Adventures of Winnie the Pooh. No villain, no fatality. <laughs> As is appropriate. Then we have the rescuers, <laughs> uh, Medusa, and. Yep. Left clinging to like the boat smokestacks as it like clears away. I don't I don't remember that one too much. I had to like do a little bit of research. It's but. a great movie. Uh, next we have uh, the fox and the hound. I wish there was a fatality. There wasn't Slade, uh, who pretty much uh, hates uh, Todd more than anything. Uh, could have shot him at the end. Copper gets in the way to protect him, and he just walks away with Copper. It was just too sad. Uh, okay, here we the go. Black Cauldron. This is the beginning of Bloodbath Disney. The Black Cauldron in the movie, no one remembers. We have the <laughs> Horn King. And, like, I watched this scene, or I rewatched it recently. It makes no sense. He somehow just walks into the green fire and dies. Like, Whoa! <laughs> Definite fatality, but there's no sense to it, so not that brutal. Next, we have uh, The Great Mouse Detective, came out a year later after The Black Cauldron. Radigan the Rat, uh, voiced by the immaculate Vincent Price, R.I.P., and he fell from a clock tower, Rip. plunging to his death. That's super brutal, because like, the minutes are counting up. Yeah. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. It's, and plus, Radigan's a terrifying villain. 
So we got Oliver and Company. Yep. Skies. Sykes. And they're like Sykes, he gets his train hit into the East. Are you guys in a car and the train hits him? He goes in the East River or something like that, right? Yeah, I think he's on the Brooklyn Bridge. He doesn't realize I, that I, he's on a train. I've barely seen Oliver and Company. It's so bad. I really hate it. This is kind of like not the great years of Disney, but the next movie, The Little Mermaid, kicks there off. Will be great. Brutal. Uh, years Disney to come, 1989. Ursula's our villain. One of the most painful deaths I can remember in Disney. She gets impaled by a ship. Such a brutal fatality. That, like, With imagine mask. Just getting like killed by a tummy. boat. And then we get even dark. I mean, like almost darker with the rescuers down under McLeach. Mm-hmm. Like he is in this waterfall. Like he fights off a couple of guys. He's like, he's like celebrating, and then all of a sudden, like his like little lizard aban- abandons him, and he's like, "Oh fuck!" <laughs> <laughs> and like he realizes he's gonna die and tries to swim the other way, but gets swept over and clearly falls to his death off like a thousand foot waterfall. Yeah, he done. Like it's bad. Definite fatality. So a year after, 1991, Beauty and the Beast, we have Gaston. And he falls from the castle. And you know he dies because in his eyes, before he falls, are like the skulls with crossbones in his pupils. He dead. He dead. So uh, that was Bloodbath to... Disney from 85 to 91. Six movies in a row with a villain that died. Really brutal deaths, too. But then we go to Aladdin with Jafar. He does not die. He's actually kind of made immortal by becoming a genie alive in a lamp. I always thought he died as a kid, but reading up on it, apparently he didn't. Well, there's, a, there's like a sequel where he comes back, which he dies. But that's another story. Yes, it is. Next we have The Lion King. Probably hailed as the greatest Disney movie of all time. Uh, 1984. Yeah, yeah. 1994. The greatest year movie. And we have Scars, our villain. One of the most painful Disney deaths ever. He gets eaten alive by hyenas. Ugh. Then we go. Then we go to Pocahontas. Uh, we also kind of enter another dark period of Disney, I think, a little bit here. But Ratcliffe does not die. He is arrested and captured and sent back to London. Okay. Up next is probably one of the darkest Disney movies ever made, which is The Hunchback of Notre Dame. We have Judge Claude Frollo, who wants to kill everyone. And he, I hate this movie. Dude, it's one of my least favorite Disney movies ever. And he falls into a giant... looks like an ocean of copper just moving throughout the city. Once again, it's falling. Rough. Yeah. I have Hercules next, Hades, alive, still in hell. Ruling hell. That's all really. I got. <laughs> yeah. Then we have uh, 1998's Mulan, awesome movie. We have Sean Yu as our villain, and he dies by getting exploded by fireworks. And this is, of course, the most gruesome death of on, any Disney movie screen, of all time. Yeah, when you see it on screen. Without a doubt, this is Tarzan from what year, Stevie? 1999, Phil Collins' comeback. We- we have Clayton, and he's like in the ropes. He's just trying to chop his way out, like to kill Tarzan. And Tarzan's like, "No, Clayton, wait!" <laughs> and he hangs himself with the vines. And like the way it's revealed too, like he clearly snaps his neck. Tar- or Tarzan does this like superhero power fist down to the ground, <laughs> and a lightning bolt reflection. You see Clayton's like hanging body he's swinging like from the, the vines. Dude, that's ridiculous. That's not cool. Not what cool. I want from Disney. I don't want that from Disney. But I love it on. now as an adult. But dark, dark times as a kid. Uh, next we have Fantasia 2000, which surprisingly came out in 1999. Uh, no villain, no fatalities. Then we have Dinosaur, Ugh. also 2000. Crate Norris, he's a, also with horns. Disney fails again to make a dinosaur movie, and he falls off a cliff and dies. Boring. Yeah, it's a terrible movie. Next, we have uh, The Emperor's New Groove, Yzma, one of the funniest Disney movies you'll ever see. Uh, She does not die, but she gets turned into a kitten. Uh, Then we have a very, very forgettable phase. We're going to save Stevie's next pick. Yeah. But we have Atlantis, The Lost Empire, a very brutal death. Uh, Roki? Rourke. Roki? Rourke? Yeah, like Mickey Uh, Rourke. He takes this, like crystal and gets stabbed by the crystal, becomes a crystal person, and gets sliced to death by the <laughs> helicopter blades, and turns into a thousand pieces. Like, ugh. why? Why aren't there songs in this movie? Uh, next, this we movie have uh, 
the only gem in probably this area of Disney for a while, and that is Lilo and Stitch from the movie. I actually named my dog after this movie, Stitch. Uh, we have Dr. Jumba and Thickly. They do not die, and they become part of the family with Stitch and Lilo. Somehow I end up with Treasure Planet Silver. Uh, <laughs> he just like escapes, right? Like there's nothing. He just floats in no death. Space. Yeah, no fatalities. Uh, next we have uh, this is a really bad stretch of Disney. The worst, maybe the worst of all time. These next three. And this is also from. Let me get my notes out. From Lilo and Stitch till 2008 is our longest stretch without a fatality. So we're gonna be reading as no fatalities. Next we have 2003's Brother Bear. Uh, no villain really besides everyone in this movie is an asshole. And Sorry. no fatalities. We have Home on the Rage, Slim, Arrested, No Fatalities. We have 2005's Chicken Little. Everyone remembers that one. No villain, no fatalities. Uh, then we go to Meet the Robinsons. 2007, right? CC. Goob and... No fatalities, he just has his future altered. Next we have 2008's John Travolta classic, Bolt. Uh, dude, these are just terrible. Then we have no villain and no fatality of said villain. And now we have like three or four decent movies in a row, which set up for the monster hits, which are coming at the end of this list. But we have The Princess and the Frog, uh, The Doctor... Felicier? How do you Easy with that one. This is a kid's program. Dr. Facilier. Yeah, that, this is also one of the most brutal deaths of all time. He's like begging for his life and he's dragged into hell by all these like purple spirits from That's dogs. a very purple movie. It's, dude, that, but that part is scary. Yeah. He, he's, he, gets, he gets dragged to hell. He has like his power encrusted in like this uh, necklace and uh, I guess Tiana shatters it. And all of his debts come back, and the jaws of hell literally open up and eat him. Well, it's worth being said, this is like the coming of Bob Iger and the return to form of this This is studio. like the start of really good Disney, which is 2010's Tangled, a movie I love. Uh, we have Mother Gothel, who ends up aging rapidly. She ages like 100 years in five seconds, and then falls out of Rapunzel's tower. Mo- certainly dying. Uh, then we have Winnie the Pooh. Is this 2009? Yeah, Winnie the Pooh is 2011. <laughs> 2011. So it's like a little bit of a break, but this this 70 minute movie has a villain named Backson. Yeah, yeah. Which is just, of course, a <laughs> Pooh misinterpretation of "I'll be back soon." <laughs> <laughs> Not a real bad guy. No fatalities. Next, we have one of the scariest new Disney villains in 2012's Wreck It Ralph, which is King Candy slash Turbo. When he turns into a scary ass insect and ends up flying into Dude, a shiny light, presumably dying. He dies. That's really crazy. He does it. A bug zapper death. Yeah, he, he gets bug zapped. So for Frozen, I called Hans the main villain. Him or and the I Duke of Weasel alive. Town. Either one. But they're both Frozen solid. No fatalities. No fatalities. Next, we have actually a really creepy villain 2014's Big Hero 6, which is uh, Robert Callahan, Professor Robert Callahan. Um, not dead, but most definitely arrested. Uh, then we jump to Zootopia, Bellwether. Yeah, that it's... sheep is alive but arrested. Okay, okay. Yeah, that was kind of a dark movie too. Then this one's kind no of a fatalities. toss-up depending how you look at it. It's 2016's Moana, which it's awesome that Zootopia and Moana come out the same year. Uh, we have Taka. Moana should have won the Oscar. I think Moana should have won too. I think Moana is better than Zootopia. Uh, but uh, we have Taka. Kubo's better than both, though. But go ahead. No, it's not. We have Taka, who was um, just kind of an evil version of uh, Tafiti, so I won't call it a death, more of it's a transformation. So now let's jump into the Pixar films, jumping back to 1990. Five. Uh, 1993. Five. Uh, Toy Story, Sid alive, but he's scared the shit out of him with the toys. Dude, Sid was scary. Like, he made me really uncomfortable as a kid. Uh, we have a huge gap now between Toy Story and Bugs Life, which is 1998, three years. We have Hopper, played by the now 
much reviled Kevin Spacey, who was uh, played a grasshopper who was fed to the birds. They come, they eat, they leave. Uh, Toy Story 2 is next. <laughs> Sticky Pete, I called the main antagonist. Yeah, he and was. I think he's alive, but he's getting like makeup now with little girls, so you know. Uh, this one's kind of a split. Uh, 2001's Monster Inc. We have Randall, and I think it's uh, Water Noose. Yeah, it's Water Noose. Randall's shown at the end in a trailer getting beaten with a shovel, so that's. That's up to interpretation, because he kept screaming it was an alligator, and Water Noose was, of course, in classic Disney fashion, arrested. Then we jumped to Fun and Emo, I said no main antagonists, no fatalities. Okay, this up one's coming next is probably one of the most, it'd be quick but brutal, it's uh, Syndrome in 2004's The Incredibles. He was sucked into a jet engine. He did. That's a violent That's death brutal. for a Disney movie. It's up there. No, it's it's definitely bad, but he's such a douchebag. He deserves No it. redeeming qualities. And I love how Holly Hunter's like, don't look, don't look, when she like turns into a parachute. Yeah. Uh, the cars. Is there a main antagonist? I don't think so. Just Lightning McQueen himself. He's the only one that yeah, can stop him. No fatalities. Then we have Ratatouille, my number one. Skinner is the main antagonist. Uh, he just gets... Uh, was a Gusto's shut down, but he moves on with his life after that, so no fatality. Then we jump to Wall E. I called Otto, uh, Hal, aka the main villain. Yeah, and then Hal. Sigourney <laughs> Weaver. Sigourney Weaver, our best friend of the podcast, uh, she dies by being switched to manual. You'll call so. that a death? Yeah, I, I called a soft death. Alright, call that uh, Next we have Up, uh, the extremely sad movie 2009. Charles F. Muntz, who is our surprising uh, main antagonist by the film's end, he naturally falls to his death from probably 6,000 feet in the air. Yeah, another falling death. Then we go to Toy Story 3. If Up, Wally, or Coco aren't your favorite Pixar movie, it's definitely Toy Story 3. Lotso, he is alive, but he lives the rest of his existence tied to a dumpster truck. I wish he would have died. That was, that was driven by Sid, wasn't it? He's a bad... He was, but he's like one of the worst villains. I wish he would have died. I always thought that dumpster truck was driven by Sid, or hope there's a theory out there for that. Uh, next we have the low point of all Pixar. Two th- Not yet. 2011 <laughs> Cars 2. Low point so far. <laughs> Axel Rod is our villain. He was arrested. Then we have Brave, uh, Mordu. Mordu! I don't know how it says. Mordu! It's like, it's like a pretty cool bear fight. And then he's crushed to death by a Stonehenge brick. Stonehenge. And I think that's okay. I, I kind of like Brave. People hate Brave. I like it's Brave fine. a lot. I think the music's really good, it's and so fine. is the animation. It's a fine movie. Um, here we go with the sequels. Uh, let me go to 2013's Monster U. Okay movie, nothing special. No real villain. No fatality. Uh, inside Out, no real villain, no fatality, but R.I.P. You know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> then we go to 2000. Actually, uh, Inside Out and Good Dinosaur came out the same year. This might be a, one of the low points of Pixar. They're finding a good ways to keep going lower. Uh, the Good Dinosaur. Would you call this the worst, the worst of the originals? It's so hard to watch, and it got delayed a year. Like there was no Pixar movie in 2014 because this movie was so shitty. Uh, they snuck it in behind Inside Out. Dude, it's a bad movie. You have you have a group of five pterodactyls. Um, Why can't Disney do a good dinosaur movie? Dude, they're bad at it. So uh, I will say I'll give us a death. The pterodactyls. Um, they showed them getting swept away, and they weren't flying out of it. So I'll call that a uh, a drowning. I got Finding Dory, no antagonist, or no antagonist death. Is that fair to say? Yeah, no antagonist, no antagonist death. And that's, a, that's not a very fun movie either. It's a really shitty scene. And here we come to this year. Would you call this the low, low point of Pixar? They're doing the cla- a new classic Pixar strategy, which is tuck the shitty one. To sell toys behind the, the critically acclaimed one. ones, so yeah, so people don't realize how 
petty we are and trying to sell Cars toys. So we have Cars 3. Sorry. We have two villains here, which is Jackson Storm, kind of a villain, and you have Sterling, who's kind of a villain. Nothing happens. It's a terrible, terrible yeah. movie. Yeah, fuck that. I didn't see it. I did. Coco. It's a terrible, terrible movie. Coco, one of the funniest deaths. Amesto de la Cruz gets crushed by a bell fucking twice. Twice. And it is awesome. <laughs> Gets killed twice. Okay, the only thing I'll say was this wasn't Walt Disney Animation, but for those who are kind of felt wondering, 1993's Nightmare Before Christmas, Oogie Boogie, was de-threaded and none else but fell into a cauldron. So there you go for the deaths. All right, see you. That was spoilers.